Welcome back to First Church of the Nazarene. We are on week 10 of our Christianity, Cults, and Religions class. Tonight is the big night. It's Gnosticism and the New Age. Um, Gnosticism first, because not a, not a lot of people know about Gnosticism, and it is almost a foundation, if not the foundation, of the New Age. So we're going to learn a little vocabulary here. Um, Gnosticism is basically an ancient blend of pagan philosophies and practices, emphasizing the attainment of special knowledge, they call it gnosis or gnosis, if you want to put it the Greek pronunciation of it, over faith and or deeds. It's all about knowledge. But what kind of knowledge? Uh, gnosis, knowledge of a particular sort, that gained by personal experience. It's a knowledge of experience. Gnostic is one who knows, or at least they think they know. So what are the origins of Gnosticism? Scholars widely disagree about this, but things come up frequently like a Zoroastrianism from Persia, the worship of Dionysus from Greek, uh, Hellenistic Judaism, that's culturally Greek Judaism, and Platonism as in Plato the philosopher, and what else we got? Ideas from Egypt and Babylon. Okay, so writings, what are their writings? The most notorious is the Gospel of Thomas, and also Gospel of the Egyptians, the Apocalypse of Paul, and many more. I think there's 52 last time I heard. Um, Gnosticism also depends on myth. In fact, that's pretty much what their writings are, is myth. Now, they don't believe that they're untrue because they're myths. Their myths express their specific religious experience. And uh, what else? So their, their myth is true to their experience. Gnostics also read the Bible, but they routinely apply Gnostic hidden meanings to the text that are frequently the opposite of the intended text of the Bible. Uh, they, in fact, some people call this an inverted hermeneutic, which means an upside-down way of reading the Bible. Just read everything backwards. So this is especially true concerning the character of God and creation and saints and sinners, as we'll see. So what about God and gods? Their, uh, one of their main bishops here uh, says that Gnostic theology is very different from biblical theology. Um, he, he says that it, it reconciles monotheism and polytheism, as well as theism, deism, and pantheism. That boils down to one god, many gods, personal god, impersonal god, and everything is god. Just to keep it simple. All right, so this bishop, oh, he's the bishop of the Ecclesia Gnostica, which means the, Gnostic, the church of Gnosticism. Who thought they would have a church of Gnosticism nowadays? I think it got restarted in the 1960s, if I read right. Anyway, let's see here. So this bishop describes the true god of Gnosticism. They have a false god, too, in Gnosticism as well. Um, he is often called the unknown father. He's a lot like the, the all in all or the absolute we see in these other religions. Uh, he's often, let's see, he or it is the ultimate and transcendent god who is beyond all created universes. He did not fashion or create anything, but emanated or brought forth from within himself the substance of all there is in all the worlds, visible and invisible. It may therefore be true to say that all is God, hence pantheism, but there's a catch. Yet many portions of the original divine substance have been projected so far from their source that they underwent unwholesome changes in the process. The divinity of God, to some extent, got corrupted. Think about that. All right, what else? Regarding gods, goddesses, and the universe. Sophia, there, there's a long mythological story about the unknown father begetting eons, which are basically gods and goddesses, who beget other gods and goddesses. And one of the main ones is Sophia, um, mistakenly came to emanate from her own being a flawed being who became the creator of the material cosmos. In other words, she had a kind of a cosmic abortion or something like that, and her offspring was kind of a, a, a jerk. He didn't know his father, and he became, well, he did something he shouldn't have. He took all this divine residue that God emanated, and he fashioned it into the known material universe. Well, that's a pretty mar remarkable accomplishment, but he didn't create the stuff in the first place. Um, We'll get into that later. Um, let's see here. So he imagined himself to be the ultimate and absolute God because he didn't know who his father was, essentially. He, he's also called the Demiurgos, or Demiurge, or half-maker. Demi means half, 
Urge means maker. He's a half-creator. He's a half-baked creator God because he didn't create the stuff in the first place. He only fashioned it all together. What this means is the God that created the material universe is somewhere between stupid and evil, according to Gnosticism. So what implications does that have on the God of the Old Testament? We shall see. The evil universe and the human predicament. According to Gnosticism, the universe, space, and time are basically evil, like demons, separating us from the true God. The universe is like a prison. Man is enslaved by nature and the laws of Moses. Man is hopelessly ignorant and will never return to God until that changes. Material evil. And in fact, human, humanity is stuck evil until that changes. See, how about Jesus and the Holy Spirit? So Gnosticism teaches that Christ and the Holy Spirit were two savior eons, or gods, sent by the true God to save humanity from the work of the Demiurge, and that Christ then embodies itself, not himself, mind you, Christ is pre-gender, apparently. Christ embodies itself in the form of Jesus in order to be able to teach humans how to achieve gnosis and return to the Pleroma, the fullness of heavenly awesomeness, I think. Gnostics also taught that Christ was the offspring of gods in a pantheon and that he had no birth at all and no bodily resurrection. The Jesus that supposedly or allegedly walked the earth was either an illusion or a tangible being with a luminous or ethereal body but not really human. The Gnostics thus also insist that Jesus was not Christ. Christ was a god and Jesus was a phantom, non-existent human. Salvation. This is where things get really interesting. Gnostics teach that Christ provides salvation through gnosis. Um, Gnostics don't seek salvation from sin, but rather from ignorance of spiritual realities. This ignorance is solved only by gnosis awakening. Christ doesn't save us by his death on the cross, but by his life and teaching of mysteries. This awakening does, it comes, only, it comes not through faith or good works, but through knowledge Man is saved not through intellectual knowledge, but through revelatory experience. And one thing they made an artwork to emphasize on their page was the awakening of any individual is a cosmic event. So how cosmic is this event of salvation? Many modern Gnostic researchers and practitioners find that this cosmic event of salvation through Gnosis involves a Kundalini awakening. In Stolen Identity by Peter Jones, um, here, informs us that Mark Gaffney, a Catholic turned Gnostic, makes a case for understanding the Gnostic serpent spirituality in terms of the Hindu yoga tradition of Kundalini energy, in which personal identity and the identity of God are fused. Jones adds, as early as the first century claims Gaffney, Gnostic quote-unquote Christians were practicing a fully developed system of kundalini yoga very similar to what is described in the Vedas and practiced in India today. Jones spots Gaffney observing that the root word of Vedas is vid, meaning to know, as in gnosis. Other aspiring authorities and sources seem to affirm these same findings, but I'm not going to take time going through them. They have more questionable credibility in a lot of cases. Moving forward, death and reincarnation. Long story short, yes, Gnostics do believe in reincarnation, but they don't lead with it. They just kind of are forced into it by being so optimistic, apparently. Okay, so now we're going to get real about this. Um, Gnosticism versus the God of the Bible. Uh, so this section I'm about to read from is, is kind of inspired by or sourced from Stolen Identity. So there's going to be some quoting kind of chopped up and mixed in with um, paraphrasing. The, it, there, if you want the footnotes, there's a, a longer version of this presentation in the appendix, Appendix G for Gnosticism. It's longer, it has footnotes. So Isis worship. Hippolytus, the early church father, documented that the Gnostics of his day sought the wisdom of the pagans, noting that Christian Gnostics attended the ceremonies of Isis worshiping mystery cults. And let's advance the slide here. Yes, we're on Gnosticism now. And there's a scene of Isis talking to Billy Batson, who becomes Shazam. This is back in the mid-70s. Now she's flying along with them to go find some uh, 
the girls that got kidnapped or something like that. All right. So ISIS, yeah. Um, in a Gnostic, oh, let's see. They want these ISIS worshiping mystery cults in order to understand the universal mystery. That's what these Gnostic Christians were seen doing. In a Gnostic text, Sophia claims to be the one whose name is great in Egypt, which is known to be Isis, who also claims, I am nature, the universal mother, the single manifestation of all gods and goddesses am I. Sounds like something we studied last week. Okay, how about this? Contempt for the Lord slash Jehovah slash Yahweh. You know, Yahweh is the modern pronunciation of the name of the Lord. Old school would be Jehovah. Our Bibles usually just say the Lord. Anyway, Gnostics religiously demonized the God of the Old Testament as the Demiurge, that evil creator they called Yaldabaoth. Just think of the Yah as in a play on Yahweh, I think. Uh, and they equated him, the evil creator, with the Old Testament Yahweh. They called him ignorant, arrogant, stupid, mad. In fact, they even have a special counter history that they do all the time when they read things. Gnostics fundamentally believe the opposite of the biblical message. One, teaching that Sophia sent the serpent to Eden as a hero bringing light and wisdom. Two, teaching that this serpent was the first appearance of the Gnostic Christ and that later it reincarnates in Jesus. And if you haven't seen enough, Three, teaching that characters like Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, and the prophets are laughingstocks for being friends of this imposter god. Four, teaching that the seven days of creation were really seven evil demons with names. And five, teaching that the Sodomites were the great incorruptible race and victims of being burned by brimstone and fire unjustly. Hmm. Breaking the law of Moses, naturally they're going to do this. The Gnostic bishop affirms that Gnostics religiously broke the law of Moses. He says, since the effort is to restore the wholeness and unity of the Godhead, active rebellion against the moral law of the Old Testament is enjoined upon every man. Translation, if you want to get back to God, you've got to be on his wavelength. And if you want to be on God's wavelength, you've got to believe the Old Testament is from hell, basically. Oh yeah, Gnostics also showed contempt for being fruitful multiplying, like it's the evil creator's trap and it produces beasts on the earth. Uh, they so eagerly opposed the Adam and Eve model for human behavior that they encouraged androgyny and other alternatives, as the Gospel of Thomas says. Now I'm just going to read the underlined portions here. Okay, Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and so make the male into female, and the female, a single one, so that the male won't be male, nor the female female, yada, 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 you, then you'll enter the kingdom. Uh, there's a footnote for the source on that, Gospel of Thomas, uh, in the Appendix G. Marcion, the famous heretic from about 85 to 160 AD, tried to establish a Gnostic Christianity by canonizing a special New Testament, including only a shortened version of Luke and mostly most of Paul's letters, supposing Paul to be the only true apostle. He got kicked out of the church big time. All right, modern Gnostics and their sympathizers. The founder of the modern Gnostic movement, Samuel A. Weor, uh, wrote a book devoted to demonstrating that serpent symbols were found in all religions and mythologies. He even includes Christianity reasoning that the great Kabir Jesus would never have advised his disciples, be ye therefore wise as serpents, he even writes that at the bottom of his book here, be ye wise as serpents, if it had been a symbol of a demon. So just like that, he's just proven in his own mind that Jesus was pro-serpent. Also, Caitlin Matthews, a contemporary pagan priestess of Isis, said, the strong character of Isis is the goddess became the Sophianic touchstone of Gnosticism, and Gnosticism serves most admirably as a bridge for paganism to infiltrate Christianity. You see the agenda? Gnosticism is made to infiltrate Christianity. 
at the Huff Post, we read Yahweh. Okay, this is a post by various authors that are not modern Gnostics. And one of them says, Yahweh is capricious at time, and at times evil-minded. And another person says, Gone is the God of damnation, the focus on sin and retribution. Gnostic spirituality encourages us to seek the transcendent, the God above all other gods, as the source of our being. This Gnostic awakening is so massive that we are... Unfortunately, the web page cuts it off there. So, but the article is called uh, The Case for Gnosticism, Part 1, The Ultimate Heresy. Makes sense. Anyway, there's some Christian responses from Peter Jones. Uh, I'll just read the second one. He's, he draws a contrast between, one, the Gnostic Gospel, which stands for a mystical state of superconsciousness in which you receive gnosis about the transcendent nature of your being. And on the other hand, you get the biblical kingdom, which is an event in time seen in the person of Jesus, uh, which occurs to bring about the redemption of God's good but fallen creation. All right, now for New Age spirituality, which is based somewhat on Gnosticism. I'm going to read from page five of the brochure tonight, Christianity, Cults, and Religions. About the founder. It's based on Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, paganism. It's popularized by the actress Shirley MacLaine, born around 1934. Uh, the beliefs vary a lot in New Age. Writings. No holy book. They use selective passages from the Bible. I Ching, Hindu, Buddhist, and Taoist writings. Native American beliefs. Writings on astrology, mysticism, and magic. God. Well, we've probably seen enough about God today. Uh, we see everything and everyone is God. God is an impersonal force or principle, not a person. People have unlimited inner power and need to discover. Jesus. Jesus is not the one true God. He is not a savior, but a spiritual model and guru, and is now an ascended master. He was a new ager who tapped into divine power the same way that anyone can. Tapped into divine... Okay. Many believe he went east to India or Tibet and learned mystical truths. He did not rise physically from the dead, but rose into a higher spiritual realm. Holy Spirit, sometimes considered a psychic force, man is divine and can experience psychic phenomena as, such as contacting unearthly beings. Salvation, no need to offset bad karma with good karma can tap into supernatural power through meditation, self-awareness, and spirit guides. Followers use terms such as reborn to describe this new self-awareness. Death. Human reincarnations occur until a person reaches oneness with God. No eternal life has, as a resurrected person, no literal heaven or hell. Other beliefs can include yoga, meditation, visualization, astrology, channeling, hypnosis, trances, and tarot card readings use of crystals to get in harmony with God or energy for psychic healing, contact with spirits, developing higher consciousness, or other psychic powers. They strive for world peace and unity. Emphasis on holistic health. New Age spirituality, according to sociologist Carmen Cooling, is an eclectic mix of Eastern mysticism, self-help therapy, paganism, and other philosophies. According to an Archbishop, uh, Thomas Wensky, New Age is old Gnosticism. Walter Martin tells us that the essence of New Age philosophy is the unity of the world's religions as diverse paths with the same goal. New Age worldview. Some examples include neo-paganism, like we saw last week. We got witchcraft, Wicca, Druidry, etc. Gnosticism, as we mentioned, and related philosophies like Hermeticism and Perennialism. Don't look those up, they're pretty complicated. New Thought, we'll be looking at this in a, maybe one or two weeks, uh, especially Christian Science and Unity Church. New Age Leaders and big names consist of Deepak Chopra, Eckhart Tolle, Rhonda Byrne, Esther Hicks, and Neil Donald Walsh. So what are some examples of New Age practices? Well, there's the altered state, a mental state where critical thinking is suspended, often through meditation. It's like hypnosis and trances, Meditation can be seen as any technique involving deliberately focusing the mind on certain things. Yoga is an example of meditation. Uh, it comes from Hinduism. 
It's used for altered states of consciousness. What is mindfulness? It's used in various ways, and I actually have a question mark on it because it can mean anything from not worrying so much about the past or future to kind of emptying your mind in some ways. So just look it up, and if people are asking you to do mindfulness, just make sure what it is before you do it. Um, contemplative prayer. Okay, so this focuses on one word that is repeated throughout the prayer. Hmm. Repetition is something used by the New Age. Now, one website, christianwalk.com, the full link is in the footnotes here, but they sort of weigh both sides of the issue. They respect both sides. I think they come down on the side of yes to contemplative prayer. But it's worth noting that former New Agers like Brian Flynn recognize that the practice is exactly the same as what he practiced in the New Age before he left it. He has a website in the footnotes. Divination. Finding hidden messages or information in things, such as astrology, which is finding information in the plants and stars, tarot readings, you look at a deck of cards and you figure out your life, uh, aura, it's like a colored energy emanation around people that some people read and make sense out of. Occult is almost another word for divination, but it's, you know, it's practices used to discover hidden means or work supernatural powers. Spiritualism. Contacting the spirits of the dead. Or it could be angels, gods, or aliens, according to some people. Uh, think necromancy. Think seances. Uh, it involves a medium. And what does a medium do? They channel. They provide sort of that happy medium between a spirit and a whoever wants their questions answered. Channeling is where you... I guess, bring that spirit through yourself and let them talk through you. Spirit guide. Pretty much what it sounds like. A spirit that comes along, uh, pretends to be your friend, or maybe acts like your friend. And, you know, some people say that it becomes their enemy when they try to break company with it. In fact, a lot of people are convinced they are demons. And so I would say don't mess around with, with spirit guides. Ouija boards. Most people have heard about Ouija boards. Um, it's kind of a form of divination, but it's uh, basically imagine a board with letters all over it and a mm, wooden object with a hole in it. Basically the idea is one or maybe two people put their hands on this wooden thing, they ask a question of the spirits, and then the wood mysteriously moves. And, this, and uh, it spells out words to answer questions. Um, I've known some people that didn't believe in it, and they couldn't believe what was happening when they were watching words get spelled. Anyway, um, Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Occult uh, has a three-page testimony about an exorcism that, uh, well, actually, he has two things. One was um, a story about a Ouija board and how a, a demon got mad that some Christian tried to interfere with the whole thing, and actually the demon did violence. Uh, during this whole thing until they called on the name of Jesus. and uh, Plus, Walter Martin also in that same book, and there's a video here, a link as well, uh, led at least one exorcism, um, one in particular uh, for a lady that uh, had been in the New Age and she needed deliverance. Crystals. They got crystals for a lot of things in the New Age. For higher consciousness, contact with spirits, psychic power, psychic healing, harmony with God slash energy, to become one with the universe. That's what harmony with God means in the New Age. Psychic abilities. You might have thought that psychic abilities only had to do with knowing things, sensing things, maybe knowing the future, but actually it turns out there's a long list of psychic abilities. You can look it up. There's even a longer list on Wikipedia, but uh, it, basically it has to do with the soul. It comes from the word soul. Psychic comes from soul. It almost means soulish. So it's not powers for your, from your muscles, and it's not powers from a foreign object, like a crystal or a wand. It's powers from your own soul, apparently. And these, par these involve things like clairvoyance, clairaudience, and others. These four items at the top mean seeing things, hearing things, sensing things, and knowing things. Astral projection, an out-of-body experience. It is different from the levitation of the body, but they're both psychic abilities. Automatic writing. Writing by a spirit, using the hand of a human. Channeling, divination, we already heard about those. Uh, Precognition, knowing beforehand. Retrocognition, knowing afterward, after events happen. 
telepathy, reading or sending thought to the mind of another person, psychometry, touching an object and sensing a specific person's previous contact with them, remote viewing, seeing or sensing things far away without actually being there, telekinesis, moving things around without touching them, psychic healing, psychic surgery, pretty self-explanatory. So then there is personal power. I, I kind of grouped these myself. Uh, shamanism, basically a shaman controls spirits or forces, often while in a trance state. Chi, by various spellings, it's the supposed life energy permeating the universe and a person's body and manipulated for healing and spiritual benefits. Remind you of the forest from Star Wars? It, this is also from Taoism, Chi. Magic, everyone knows what magic is, and if it has a K, it's, it's trying to emphasize real magic, not stage magic. Let's see, holistic health. What is holistic health? Um, they do talk about mind and body at the website, but you dig down to the final page, and let's see, they say that the, the magic of quantum healing, they now call it quantum healing, uh, also called cellular healing, is based on one fundamental concept, where thought goes, energy flows. Visualization. Using the mind to influence one's perceptions and personal reality. It appears closely tied to the law of attraction at a psychic website. It's listed in the footnote. Law of attraction. Belief then that thoughts have frequencies or vibrations that create the realization or actualization of those thoughts in one's own reality, regardless of whether they were thought of things wanted or unwanted. So you say, give me pizza or take away pizza, and pizza just comes to you, apparently, whether you wanted it or not. As long as the pizza is in your mind, it's what's coming. All right, books and movies of New Age intrigue. The Law of Attraction. So actually, um, I forgot to mention earlier for spiritualism. Um, long story short, there was a lady um, named um, Laura Maxwell. She actually helped edit Shrewd as Serpents with me. But um, she used to be in spiritualism. And it was a terrible time getting out of it. Um, I think it caused the death of her mother. But she is now helping with, teach the world all that is wrong with spiritualism and other things like that. Anyway, back to Law of Attraction. Um, basically, this, the introduction to this book um, tells how Esther Hicks became a medium, a human Ouija board, by her own description, the Ouija board being in quotes there, um, channeling for Abraham, not Father Abraham, a group of obviously non-physical teachers who present their broader perspective through Esther Hicks. So these teachers have come forth, okay, so I'm going to just quote a few from the book here. These teachers have come forth not to alter your beliefs, but to reacquaint you with the eternal laws of the universe, so that you may intentionally be the creator that you have come forth to be, and there is not another who attracts into your experience that which you are getting. You are doing it all. So that's all they want to tell you, but they don't want to alter your beliefs or anything like that, right? See how this works? If you buy what they're saying, you don't have to leave Christianity. You get to still call yourself Christian. So let's see, what else? There would be no reason for the word evil in, to be in our vocabulary because there is nothing that we are aware of that we would label with the word. When humans use the word, they usually mean that which opposes good. We have noticed that when humans use the word evil, they mean something that opposes their idea of what is good or what is God. Evil is that which one believes is not in harmony with what they want. So good and evil are not real. It's all about what you want and don't want. Elsewhere. So there's a section of the book called I Invited It by Giving It Thought. It explains that if you think about things you don't want to experience, the universal laws bring those experiences upon you without considering the part about you not wanting them. Abraham on God, basically, okay, so this lady here is about to ask questions of Esther Hicks, and long story short, she wants to know about God. So the whole answer takes like 
seven minutes or so, but only the last 30 seconds or so are really important. So I'm gonna just skip to the end here. And by the way, Esther Hicks is channeling for, for, for Abraham. But words don't teach. You have to have your own personal experience in order to have that knowing. And that's why every word that is uttered through Esther that is offered from us is a word and now translated by you to help others understand that you are the creator of your own reality. You are the God that is the creator of worlds, you see. Don't be humble and try to make yourself apart from that. Embrace it and accept it and ride that wave. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, no bones about it. Um, you are the god of your own reality. And not only that, but she says don't be humble and try to make yourself apart from that. You know, we Christians always make ourselves apart from that. God is God and we are not. Yet, with them, it's the opposite. In fact, I remember somewhere in the book she said something about how you don't really want to pray to someone else because then you, you're out of touch with the fact that you are the one you should be praying to, essentially. Um, earlier, I was supposed to show a slide about spellcrafting for the Christian witch. Um, we learned last week you can't really be a Christian witch. Even the Wiccans seem to admit that. But some people think you can just by calling yourself and then there's this bunch, the New Christian Spiritualist Society. Welcome to our church. In fact, zooming in on it, I don't know if you can see it, the New Christian Spiritualist Society. It's just what it sounds like. Spiritualism, you go to the website, you'll see it. Um, and we're already here. So books and movies. We already talked about the Law of Attraction. How about conversations with God? Neil Donald Walsh, he also wrote the foreword to The Law of Attraction. He wrote this older book called Conversations with God, Part One, and other parts as well. Um, he, he started his book, well, what started his book was he was writing an, an angry letter to God. And when he finished his angry letter, he couldn't move his hand. He couldn't put his pen down. He just became the victim of automatic handwriting. The rest of the book became the result of that automatic handwriting. So what we're going to get from this book is a lot of opinions from the God of conversations with God. The third one down, your will for you is God's will for you. You are living your life the way that you are living your life, and I have no preference in the matter. I do not care what you do, and, what is, and that is hard for you to bear. Elsewhere he says, The first lie, the lie which you hold as truth about God, that God cannot be trusted, that God's love cannot be depended on, that God's acceptance of you is conditional. Yet, if you knew who you are, that you are the most magnificent, most remarkable, and the most splendid being God has ever created, you would never fear. Who could ever reject such a wonder, a wondrous magnificence? Not even God could find fault in such a being. Ever heard of flattery being used in the New Age? God doesn't flatter people like that. At least the God of the Bible doesn't. Let's see what else we got here. This is what your religions mean when they say that you were created in the image and likeness of God. It does mean that our essence is the same. We are the same stuff. With all that, with all the same properties and abilities, including the ability to create physical reality out of thin air. Elsewhere, thus it can be said that my purpose for you is that you should know yourself as me. You are your own rule maker, you set the guidelines, and you decide how well you have done. Who needs a judge of the world? You are your own judge, apparently, in, in conversations with God. Oh, what has been described as the fall of Adam was actually his upliftment, the greatest single event in the history of mankind. You should thank them from the bottom of your hearts for being the first to make a wrong choice because Adam and Eve produced 
the possibility of making any choice at all. God of this book also says, I do not love the good more than I love the bad. Hitler went to heaven. When you understand this, you will understand God. Do you want your life to truly take off? Then change your idea about it. Think, speak, and act as the God you are. Elsewhere, God says, all attack is a call for help. Walsh responds, I read that in A Course in Miracles, another book by automatic handwriting, supposedly by Jesus. God responds to him by saying, I put it there. All right, elsewhere, use the great commandment that calls forth creative power, I am. Make I am statements to others. I am is the single greatest creative statement in the universe. Whatever you say after the words I am sets into motion those experiences, calls them forth, brings them to you. The universe responds to I am as would a genie in a bottle. Finally, you will never find me in your mind, says the God of that book. In order to truly know God, you have to be out of your mind. All right. I'll try to wrap up the New Age section here. Walter Martin will close us out with uh, the core of New Age theology is the integration of all religions, practices, mythology, superstition, and the occult found in the world. It refuses to bow the and worship the biblical God of creation. Verses we had last week, these, especially Deuteronomy 18, 9b through 11, about you know, God forbidding people to have mediums, spiritualists, you know, soothsayers, people raising the dead. It's all pretty clear that the New Age is not in league with the Bible. It's not, it's not obedient to the Bible. At best, they might twist it and trick people, but um, you can read these verses on your own. And with that in mind, I'm going to take questions or comments at this time, if there are any. There's a lot in here. One thing I was going to talk about in, in my segment is gnosis, and I'm glad you had the definition in here, Robert. Knowledge of a particular sort that gained by personal experience. And that's one of the dangers we're seeing in today's church, do you not agree, oh, is yeah. that people want to have spiritual experiences. Yes, yes. There, some of them are just madly longing for it, um, and they just won't settle for anything less. They won't settle for, you know, a Bible, a God who sent a Savior to save them, and hope of eternal life at the end of this one. Um, they just have to have those experiences. When, uh, I'm, you know, in, in the, uh, I'm going to here in a minute, going to be talking about physics of heaven, and I, um, I, you let me borrow the book, because I would never buy this thing, but you let me borrow it so that I could read just some key sections. And I mean, the, the key sections you highlighted was, to me, uh, just absolutely, I mean, mind-blowing how they were using, trying to use Scripture to validate involvement in the New Age movement. And are those, thus my question would be, people that want to have these spiritual experiences and they end up sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly messing around in the New Age movement. Why do they not understand that it is something that God has forbade, number one, but, but something that is flat out dangerous? I mean, what's the mindset? I think it could be part ignorance, it, it could also be that they're, they've got their assumptions in mind, which is another form of ignorance. Um, 
And I think there's also a certain yearning for something better than what they find in Christianity, something, again, with experiences and empowerment. And I think part of it is they don't know, and part of it is they don't want to believe it because, wow, over there they got magic going on. Magic must confirm it. You know, so watch the miracles, the miracles prove it, case closed. And so they, um, they find ways to convince themselves. One of my favorite jokes of Stephen Wright, the comic, uh, was I, I had a girlfriend who was a psychic, but we never met uh, <laughs> because yeah, she, she was a psychic, but we never met. Um, and uh, when you talk to people that do go to psychics, they claim that the psychics read their mail. But when it comes to, well, okay, what do I do? Do I take this job or I take the other job? Uh, do I marry this woman or do I marry that woman? Are they taking shots in the dark? I mean, why are some psychics able to tell people of their past, strangers tell them of their past? You know, I, I can only imagine spirits, probably evil spirits, are you know experts at collecting intel on a lot of people. You know, supposedly they they are they're very fast moving, um, almost like a, a spiritual internet of sorts. Correct. Um, and um, I would imagine that that can explain knowledge about one's past. Yeah, but then they're just taking stabs in the dark as far as future events. Well, as one movie said, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, um, the other thing, too, is, it, it, you know, horoscopes are in that same ballpark. Um, it, it just seems as though it's ancient practices, pagan practices, that seem to have lasted through the centuries. Is that true? What? Yeah, it, there is a lot of ancient paganism that, that has come into not only Gnosticism, but the New Age as well. It, it, the New Age is a blend of old paganism and new thought and philosophy and um, just a lot of mental bubblegum. Yeah. Um, I have my favorite joke about astrology is, yeah, I read my horoscope today, it said, don't eat used meat, you know, and that's about how, how ignorant, uh, you know, uh, most of them are. I mean, they, but what is the warning, I suppose, you would have for Christians who daily read their horoscope, go to palm readers? Uh, I would tell them to read Deuteronomy 18, I have to look it up here on my PowerPoint. Well, no, Let's I can... fast forward through this and... Oh, God, it's last week's presentation here. Okay, okay. When you have it up there, I'll show it. I could look it up real fast, too. There, no, it's not here. Probably going to edit this part out. <laughs> well, Deuteronomy 18 is a, a powerful uh, uh, chapter. Uh, and it's one that a lot of people, because it also talks about false prophets. Um, Deuteronomy 18.9 that you have there, I'll just read it out loud. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Okay, that, yep, yeah, exactly. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium, or a spiritist, or who consults the dead. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, by the way, later in the, um, in the same chapter, verse 14, the nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery and or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. 
The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among your own brothers. You must listen to him. Now that's, some people think that that's, um, you know, prophetic of, of uh, Christ. Um, and, and then it goes on and, and talks about how, it, but verse 20, but a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. <laughs> yeah. So we don't see uh, we don't see stonings, do we? Yeah. <laughs> of of modern day prophets, so called prophets. Well, hey, what have you learned in reading of that book? First of all, it's this book that uh, I was referring to is one that is called the Physics of Heaven, written about two years ago by uh, published by Destiny Image. It's, a conf it's kind of a, a, a series of authors. All of these authors um, have something to do with Bethel Church in Reading. So this is perhaps the biggest evidence we have of so-called Christians trying to integrate what Robert just got through in the last 35 minutes talking about, and that is the New Age Movement, and trying to brand it as being Christian or trying to adapt it. Uh, one, I want to start on page 13. This is a woman who I understand, uh, Ellen Davis, who um, is right in the, the midst of the new, uh, was in the midst of the New Age movement, noticeably so, came out of the hippie movement of the 1960s. And she starts off by quoting a, a scripture in the book of Jeremiah. And, and I want to read this because here's what she quotes. God says, if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. Then here's the comment. We may have to delve into areas we previously considered off limits to extract the precious from the worthless and recover lost, now get this, recover lost truths that belong to the people of God. Well, that's just one, one thing right off the bat. All the truth we need to know is right here in the Word of God, okay? There aren't any lost truths. Now, this is unfortunately with a lot of people in not just the Bethel movement and a lot of the charismatic movement for that matter, is our people that like to take a scripture and find one that backs up their own belief, their own premise. That's a, that's a process that's known as eisegesis. But we know that Christians are to exegete script, scripture. In other words, read scripture and from what you read, take out of it what God is trying to tell us not have a pre-made idea and then go searching for a scripture that might answer your idea. Because your idea might be totally wrong. So again, here is an example in, in Jeremiah 15, 19, where she takes just one part of the scripture, if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. Here's the whole scripture. Listen to this. This is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. What's he talking about? The prophet Jeremiah is talking really about salvation. Repenting from our evil ways. Okay, he's not talking about finding hidden truths. You see the big difference right there. So that's the first thing. She goes on later to say, to say this. Now, get this. She had experienced most of what charismatic Christianity has had to offer. Miracles, prophecy, healing, deep revelation, transformative experiences of the presence of the Holy Spirit, excellent Bible teaching, and I have been involved in at least five modern-day moves of God in the church. 
Well, that's a, that's a, we're going to talk about this on the 25th of August, by the way, when we talk about aberrant Christian theology. Um, we're going to talk about so-called moves of God, that God does new things for a season. Now, that's taken right out of the mouth of a lot of the charismatic leaders in today's church. God, so right away, we got an issue there. Does God do new things? I don't think so. It's the same Bible. It's the same Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, listen to what else she had. I moved to Sedona. This is in Arizona. I moved to Sedona fully prepared to discount everything I saw and heard as coming from a source other than the God I knew and loved. But as a scientist, I was intrigued by what I found there. I saw healings and mystic experiences and revelations to rival anything I had seen or experienced in the church. I encountered an understanding of the natural world and how it interacted with the spiritual that I had sensed but had never been taught in any of my science classes. She goes on to say, a lot of what I saw and heard in the New Age movement embodied biblical principles and could be backed up by scripture. I would really challenge that. I would really challenge this. Again, she is trying to find these, find these mystical experiences uh, deep in the, deep in mysticism and think that there is God in it. It's um, and, and she says that it's time for Christians to take back, this is page 15 of the book, Christians taking back truths from the New Age that really belong to the citizens of the kingdom of God. I mean, to I mean again, the only truths we are to know are right here. We're not taking back any truths because what the New Age movement has is nothing more than counterfeit. Now, I'm going to move on because there's also a gentleman in this same book. Again, we're the physics of heaven. I'm going to go to page 42 in the book. This is a gentleman. His name is Jonathan Welton. Again, he opens up with a scripture. 1 John 2, 27. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, that anointing is real, not counterfeit. And what Welton goes on to say is whenever there is real, there should be a counterfeit. But we shouldn't be ex exactly afraid to examine the counterfeit because we ought to take it back from the devil. All right. Now, 1 John 2.27, again, is partially quoted here. Let me read it to you in its entirety. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you. Now that's talking about God. All, all Christians, all, all Christians have an anointing, okay, from God. The anointing you receive from him remains in you. You do not need to teach, need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. Okay? He told, he's teaching what, what we learn here in the Bible is the truth. Okay? It's anointed. Not me anointed necessarily. Well, you know, believers, I guess, have a sense of, we're all anointed. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is living in us, okay? He, aware, he, he tells us and shows us all truth, all right? But it doesn't say anything in that scripture that we are supposed to chase after the counterfeit and redeem the counterfeit, or as he was saying, to take back the counterfeits. Okay, and then they have a premise here 
And I'd be interested, Robert, if, to hear you. This premise, it, premise is that if there is a counterfeit, there is an authentic that we need to find and reclaim. Well, you know, it sounds nice of him to point out that the, the evil ways of Satan are counterfeits. Sounds like he's criticizing it. But he could just say it's a fraud or something else. But it almost seems like he's conveniently using the criticism of counterfeit in order to rationalize that there must be a real behind it in order to reclaim. Right. And, and well, it's something that mystics have come up over, over the years. They've, they've come up with this on their own. There isn't, it wasn't stolen from God. It wasn't <laughs> stolen from, from the Bible. Okay? He, he made that part up too. He made, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this entire chapter of, of, of the physics of heaven is loaded with a lot of presumption that behind everything that the New Age has is a truth, and we need to bring it back. I'm going, huh? Nowhere does it say to reclaim the counterfeit. Nowhere does the Bible tell us to do that. There's no text for that. Now, the next thing uh, towards the back of the book, um, and this one is particularly concerning because I, I was in the charismatic church in, um, in the 1990s when the Toronto blessing, as they called it, was occurring at the airport vineyard church in Toronto, Canada. And a lot of phenomenon was going on. People would, uh, these so-called uh, prophets of God would touch people that were in, literally lay hands on them. Uh, people would be jerking and shaking. Uh, some people would be stuck to their chairs. Some people would be stuck to walls. People would uh, roar like lions. Some people would um, stumble around drunk. They called it being drunk in the spirit. And these were supposed, alleged phenomenon brought on people by the Holy Spirit. Problem is, you can't find any of that in here. Now, somebody would right away say, I know which some, a couple of you are going to say, well, you're putting God in a box. No, I'm putting God in his book. Find experiences like this. And it gets back to what you were talking about earlier, Robert, when you talked about gnosis. Knowledge of a particular sort gained by personal experience. I love that, uh, that definition. Here is the leader of Bethel Church up in Reading. This is Bill Johnson. In 1995, I began to cry out to God day and night for around eight months. My prayer was, God, I want more of you at any cost. I will pay the price. Now I'm going to stop right there. Are we to really ask God for more of him? I maintain we're to study his word to know him that's how you get more of God but let's move on and see what happened to Mr. Johnson after supposedly eight months of asking for this one night in October God came in answer to my prayer yet not in a way I had expected I went from being in a dead sleep to being wide awake in a moment Unexplainable power began to surge through my body. If I had been plugged into a wall socket with a thousand volts of electricity flowing through my body, I can't imagine that it would have been much different. It was as though an extremely powerful being had entered the room and I could not function in his presence. My arms and legs shot out in silent explosions as this power was released through my hands and feet. The more I tried to stop it, the worse I got two uh, down at the next the bottom of the next paragraph here's what he says he came he God came in response to the prayer I had been praying what's your problem with that well it looks kind of like a kundalini encounter I mean I read this book uh, part of it's about kundalini experiences mm -hmm. and electrical current type feelings and headaches and all um, those are common symptoms of that yeah and those kind of experiences whereas 
we can't find it here in the Word of God, can be found in Hinduism. And that, that should sober up a Christian who has ever thought about wanting more of God and expecting to go to meetings at churches, so-called Christian churches, and, and experience shaking, uncontrollable shaking, um, being slain in the spirit, uh, people jerking on the floors, et cetera, et cetera. Let me add one more. Now, this is the wife of Bill Johnson. I believe her name is uh, Benny, Benny Johnson. She talks about coming back from the meeting I referred to earlier at the Airport Christian Fellowship in Toronto, Canada. One night after the meeting ended, we were headed to the back of the church, and there were people laid out on the floor, laughing and having all kinds of physical manifestations. I was holding on to Bill's arm. I noticed what looked like a very inebriated man staggering around touching people. I had heard of this condition before and knew what this man was, drunk in the spirit. What happened next changed my life forever. Now get this, and she is a leader of a large church that is supposedly a Christian church in Redding, California. I will always be grateful to that man for his drunkenness. We have a lot of people recovering from alcoholism in our church right now. I, I would hate for them to hear this. They're going to via this video. But they'll shake their head at this, I promise you. Because they really did spend a life in drunkenness, mm -hmm. alcoholism. Here's uh, what Miss Johnson says. He, the man being drunk, and I, made eye contact, headed straight toward me. At when he reached me, he touched me with his finger on my forearm. That was all. That was enough. A holy current went inside me. And I, and I really have problems with that because you're attributing this experience to the Holy Spirit by calling it a holy current. Here's what she says, though. Not just on the outside of me, but on the inside as well. When that current hit, hit me, I began to shake so violently that my husband had to let go of my arm. I fell to the ground, and for the next half hour, I looked like I was plugged into an electrical socket. That, my life changed that day. I came in contact with the energy of heaven. I, I, I don't, I know, that leaves me speechless. But there are thousands of people that are falling, who call themselves Christian, that are falling to this. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, Robert, that you just got through expounding upon to here tonight. We've allowed Gnosticism, we've allowed New Age to sneak into the church. I'm almost speechless. I mean, I mean, when I read that kind of stuff, and this woman is, is supposed who, who gave this testimony in this book is supposed to be the leader of a Christian church here in California. Um, make up, you know, make up your mind for yourself. There is a, uh, I, I guess, I guess my way of wanting to. Uh, do you have anything you want to say? Because I kind of. Well, you know, say. we can do our part to learn about this and learn about what they're saying, learn about what the Bible has to say about it. It may take time to study it, but we can you know, have a goal of being equipped to respond, to either help other Christians at our church know what to be ready for, or if we encounter uh, a Bethel friend, uh, we can have conversations with them about these things and mm -hmm. um, you know, hope for a miracle. And my prayer is that if you're, you're part of the, the Bethel Church, is also part of a greater movement. They, today they have the name, the uh, New Apostolic Reformation, the NAR. Nobody really calls themselves that, but that's kind of how they've been categorized. If you have questions about the Bible, read this for yourself. Don't let somebody help you misunderstand this. The Bible's pretty simple. Man 
will make you, will help you misunderstand this really quick. So learn the Bible for yourself. My, and finally, I want to say this, and we're going to, I'm probably going to repeat this on our last of our series on the 25th of August, is that I want everybody to realize that we don't need the experiences in order to help us explain the Bible. The Bible will cause biblical experiences to happen in leading somebody to Christ. I had the wonderful opportunity to minister to a young man here um, at, at the church today. Very insecure, very fearful of the things going on in the world today. And I, and I had a chance to talk to him about the peace that God has, the peace that you find. And I encourage him, read your Bible. Start in Proverbs. Read the book of Proverbs. Get to know the Bible itself. When you get to know this, you don't need special experiences such as what is being described in here. You won't need this because this will be all that you want. Okay? I hope that helps you tonight. I really do. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you for, so much for your word. Thank you for this uh, teaching tonight. We pray that people were ministered to and understand more deeply that sola scriptura, the Bible itself, is all we need for daily living and for Christian living. Help us and inspire us to walk according in your ways as you write about in this, in this Bible. Father, thank you for those that are watching for those that are here tonight, that uh, you uh, inspire them to pass this on to many others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.